And now, just to finish this session, we're going to go with uh, my talk on the uh, new technology in terms of uh, stents for carotid artery stenting. This is my disclosure. And it has been mentioned before that the greatest risk associated with carotid artery stenting is distal embolization. And distal embolization can be expressed by the uh, occurrence of a stroke if macro particles go to the brain, or silent infarcts if micro particles go to the brain, as uh, it was mentioned in the uh, previous lecture by uh, Dr. Wallach. Uh, we know that every time we do carotid artery stenting without protection, there is significant embolization. And that happens in every single uh, step of the procedure, when we cross the lesion, when we predilate, and when we do uh, stent deployment. The timing for the uh, embolization or the uh, complications during CAS has been well described. We have different phases uh, during the procedure, uh, phase one, phase two. Uh, are important, and of course, the phase three, uh, when you do predilation, uh, stent implantation, uh, and post dilation, and recovery of the stent, uh, will show that it's very significant, as well as for, uh, phase four and five, which are uh, when the procedure has been finished. So, in general, we can say that 40% of major strokes occur during phase one and this has to be with the access to the vessel. 60% of major strokes occur during phase three, and then minor strokes occur after the procedure in phase four and phase five. So the outcomes of carotid artery stenting depend on multiple things, age of the patient, presence of symptoms, aortic arch anatomy, plaque morphology, cerebral functional reserve, and of course, experience of the operator, type of cerebral protection device use, and probably type of stent use. And this is what we should look uh, with the use of this new technology. And of course, case selection is and will continue to be a key factor in uh, the uh, results of these patients. As you know, we have multiple technology available. Uh, we have a group of filters, we have proximal protection, both flow uh, stagnation and flow reversal, and then we have open and closed cells technology. Now, as it was shown by Dr. Wallach, we have new technology in terms of flow reversal by cervical access, and we have this new technology in terms of uh, stents that I will share with you. Flow reversal, unfortunately, has been removed from the market, um, so we don't have that technology available anymore. And the uh, cervical flow reversal was well presented by Chris, so I'm going to move forward here. The results are very promising, not only in terms of preventing stroke, but also to reduce the incidence of microembolization and uh, silent infarcts. And, uh, now let's move to the carotid stent evolution. As we know, the initial carotid uh, stents were um, balloon expandable stents, and then we rapidly move uh, to self-expandable stents because we learn about the possibility of crushing those balloon expandable stents uh, with movement of the neck and and and, and multiple other reasons. So. Self-expandables are, uh, for a long period of time, uh, recognized the way, the way to go in terms of technology for the carotid application. And uh, we have basically uh, braided mesh, like the wall stand, and then the new gener relatively new generation nitinol stands. And here we have closed stands and open, uh, open cell stands. And then, a couple of years ago, a group of people came with a concept of the hybrid stent, which is the Cristallo uh, by Invatec, in which they combine open cell 
uh, at the uh, proximal and distal aspect and closed cell to prevent plaque protrusion in the middle. So what's next after all this evolution? We are now coming with a new concept, which is a stent that brings the good attributes of a closed cell device and the good attributes of an open cell device, open cell stent, because an open cell stent allows for good flexibility and the adaptation to the wall of the vessel. Um, the problem is that the fact that it's an open cell stent that allows the uh, plaque to protrude through the struts, and that's a problem. So by combining these two elements, which is a stent frame, which is open cell, with a stent lattice, which has uh, pores that are around five microns, you can obtain a combination of these two advantages in one uh, device, as you can see here. And this is the concept. On top of this, this uh, group of people have uh, put uh, a coating system with heparin that will prevent acute thrombosis of the stent. Against the stent uh, frame is open cell design with a high degree of flexibility and conformability to the native anatomy. The lattice has a high degree of plaque scaffolding that reduce plaque prolapse, reduce amount of emboli release during and after stent deployment. And the coating by heparin, uh, you know, prevent acute thrombosis and has no systemic anticoagulation effects. If you compare the size of the struts of the different stents that are available in the market, you can see how this new device, even that it's, it's just an open cell device because of the lattice. It has the smaller struts that is 500 microns compared with the, with the other ones. So we hope that this technology will prevent all the problems that we see in terms of potential uh, minor strokes uh, and some of the major strokes through uh, the struts of the of the of the stents, the delivery system is very slick. It's uh, five French, uh, can be used with uh, five French or six Frenchies according to the size. The device uh, deploys very well. It doesn't uh, jump at all, which is important. And here you have the different measurements. So this is. Uh, the uh, situation again uh, when the company uh, had the chance to uh, evaluate this uh, technology, this new technology, they had two uh, ways to protect the brain. One was a distal filter, the other one was flow reversal. They uh, decided to uh, remove flow reversal from the equation and they, yeah, yeah, and we are all sorry for that. I, I see Chris uh, agreeing with me, but they decided to do that. And then uh, they are evaluating this uh, technology in uh, what we know the uh, Gore Scaffold Clinical uh, Study. The uh, study is a multi-center, single-arm prospective study comparing the gore carotid stent to a performance goal developed from carotid endarterectomy outcomes. And again, it combines this new uh, stent with the uh, gore distal filter. The number of sites up to 50 in the United States, number of subjects 312. Uh, just to give you an update, the, uh, the, the trial has been completed very recently uh, with 100 patients uh, already enrolled. Primary endpoint composite of major adverse events defined as death, any stroke, or myocardial infarction through 30 days. And we uh, were lucky enough to be able to enroll the first uh, case in this trial, and that was in August 6. And as you can see, the enrollment was, was very, very uh, fast. Uh, it, the first patient was a 77-year-old male uh, with a history of left carotid artery occlusion and 
uh, the MRA that demonstrate flow limiting with more than 80% stenosis in the right internal carotid artery. Patient was a high risk. Here you see the images of the patient. You can see the contralateral internal carotid artery occlusion, high grade stenosis, and the different steps during the procedure. Deployment of the uh, distal filter, deployment of the stent, post-stent dilation, showing a good result. A second case that we enroll, a patient uh, symptomatic with a high-grade stenosis. The before, during deployment, and after deployment. And we end up enrolling five cases in this trial. This is another case, before and after. Another case, as you can see, these are very uh, symptom, uh, very significant lesions, and some of these patients are symptomatic. This was the last case we enrolled, as you can see, very significant lesion, almost occlusive disease with no visualization of the external carotid artery, and after treatment, you get good result and even integrated flow in the external carotid artery. So. Having now no more flow reversal, and we have all this technology now available, you wonder what could be the benefit of combining these two technologies, cervical flow reversal with membrane, because as you know, that combination can get probably rid of the 40% of major stroke that occurred during phase one, and probably some of the other ones. So that would be interesting to see if uh, in the near future these two companies get together and agree to do a trial combining these two techniques. In conclusion, embolization occurs during wire catheter manipulation and crossing the lesion when filter is used. Careful manipulation can reduce those events. Proximal protection prevents embolization during lesion crossing. Cervical access reduces or eliminates the risk of embolization from difficult aortic anatomy. And embolization can occur during stent post dilation with this cheese graded effect. Embolization occurs after protection devices are removed due to plaque protrusion through the stent struts. Probably the gore uh, carotid stent may prevent plaque protrusion, eliminating periprocedural and post procedural events. Thank you very much. So, let me see the time. Are we on? I think we are on time, right? Yes. We have some time for questions. Somebody wants to ask any question before we move to the lunch? Tom, do you want to comment something about uh, Frank's opinion on randomized trial? I mean. No, I was here. I was here. Yeah. <laughs> was definitely more affected by those who had the stroke. And so I take that point. Uh, and I think most neurologists uh, agreed with him. Unfortunately, in NASIT, in ACAS, ECST2, ACST, excuse me, ECST, the original one, they really didn't look at the impact of the strokes. Crest was the first study to do that. And neurologists haven't been as good as cardiologists, I think, in looking at the impact of stroke and trials. So I take that point point, I think it's a good one. He said that, um, that we put in the asymptomatics because uh, we weren't enrolling the symptomatics. Uh, that's partly true, but not the only explanation. The um, Crest started uh, early in 2000, well, 2001, and ACST uh, came out in 2004. And ACST in Europe uh, validated the results of ACAS. <clears throat> and uh, so that was new data. That was in the Old Testament, I think, Frank. Um, and uh, that new data uh, told us that we needed to have asymptomatics in Crest. Because, and I argued for that, not on the basis of enrollment, that if we had a trial that, 
reported its results in 2010 and we had no data on asymptomatics, that that would be an opportunity that would be lost. And so we put asymptomatics in. Now the biostatisticians state that the way to, to look at this is not to put the left-handers on one side and the right-handers on the other side or the symptomatics on one side and the um, asymptomatics on the other, the men on one side and the, the women on the other side. Right or wrong, that's no longer acceptable uh, to biostatistics. They take a trial and they look at whether or not there's an interaction with symptomatic status and outcome or being a man uh, or a woman and outcome. And they see, are there enough patients to make that a valid uh, examination? Is there a type two error? And there was not. And looking at, uh, in the modern way, looking at symptomatic status, there was no interaction. So I would disagree with his term dilution. And those, those were the two comments I would make. But uh, as always, it was a very good talk that he made. Thank you, Tom. Any other comment? Otherwise, I want to thank you for being here all morning. And now, let's go for lunch. And let's come back at uh, 1 o'clock. 2 o'clock, I'm sorry. 2 o'clock for uh, a great case discussion that was organized by Dr. Robinson with participation of the three specialties. We will have uh, Dr. Todoran from cardiology, Dr. Scott Stevens from vascular surgery, and Dr. Kenneth Thompson from interventional radiology discussing very interesting clinical cases. Thank you.